now for another exciting, exciting, inspiring session. I would like to invite you to introduce our next guest. Thank you so much, Anita. Excellent moderation. Uh, yeah, so our second speaker is Dr. Mohamed Zahir, a genetics researcher based in Tanzania. And one thing I love about uh, the work he does is that, I mean, this is debatable, but I think that Muhimbili University for Health and Allied Sciences leads the uh, sickle cell disease research in Africa. Uh, I mean, Mohamed, you're the expert, so you, <laughs> you can let me know whether this is true or not. But um, just um, to just so you know who you are speaking to, and he also co-founded the Tanzanian Human Genetics Organization. And if you don't know uh, the African Society, the 15th African Society for Human Genetics Conference is happening in Uganda next year. So the registration is up. Um, you can just uh, you know just go <laughs> online and search for abstract submission. But each uh, I think so far we have South Africa, Tanzania. And Uganda is starting their first uh, organization. So yeah, this is big. So he can he will tell us about you know how to how they you know thought about the idea of Tanzania Human Genetics Organization and how it's uh, working so far. And probably some of us from other countries, like for instance Kenya. I don't think we have this organization. People, we can uh, start thinking or envisioning having such an organization back at home. So welcome, Mohammed. I won't. Uh, delve too much i think th during the conversation we'll get to uh, know you more and know about uh, what you're doing and your work so i will dive in and you know start with a fun fact before we get into the science you know uh, can you share a fun fact with us well thank you first of all uh, thank you ruth thank you very much for inviting me to be speaking to a lot of interesting uh, youths on the call today and uh, first of all, I must congratulate you for all the good work you're doing and uh, for creating such a platform where we can really share our ideas and our thoughts uh, and, and really ignite that Pan-African spirit, which is really, really wonderful. Uh, fun fact about myself, I would say, um, and this is going to be tough to digest. I have never <laughs> tasted tea in my life. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> No way you're Tanzanian. No way you're African. <laughs> I, I, I am a coffee. Possible? I'm a coffee addict, so I have ah. never tasted tea in my life. <laughs> no way. Our ancestors will be rolling in their graves. <laughs> Anyways, okay, okay, that's good. That's a good one. All right. So, can you speak to us about how you got to, you know, your current role from university? What did you pursue? Why were you interested in genetics in the first place? and how you got to, you know, founding Tanzania Human Genetics Organization. OK, let's start from the beginning. I actually did not have any idea about what human genetics or biotechnology or molecular biology was. When I started off, you know, I, I think in Kenya, you also follow the same system. You have the O levels yeah. and then you have the A levels. So yeah. I, when I was completing my O levels, I was set to become a pharmacist. That was something that I wanted to be. Uh, and, and it was it was a decision not because I made it for myself, but I think it was sort of a collective community, uh, family kind of a pressure where you want to get into a field which is, um, you know, there is a future. You know that there is, you're not going to die hungry. You always will find a job or you will always, at the end, if not a job, you can always also just open your own shop uh, and, and, and sell medicines. So that was the plan until all levels. And then in A levels, a group of colleagues were just... Uh, completed their um, uh, uh, first ever uh, BSc degree in biotechnology in Tanzania. They introduced me to a field called biotechnology. Mm. Uh, and uh, once I understood, and this was you know, something that was organized by uh, the university students at my high school where I was studying at the time uh, in an effort towards uh, raising awareness about biotechnology. So that was my journey. I, I learned about biotechnology from them. And then the rest is history. So I, I loved the topic. I loved what biotechnologists do. Uh, and from there on, I decided, OK, I'm going to change my field. I'm not going to do pharmacy anymore. I will pursue biotechnology. So I did a, a bachelor's in biotechnology. And then uh, through biotechnology, I got introduced to microbiology, molecular biology, plant genomics, and all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and thereafter, I decided to pursue molecular biology because I was very, very intrigued mm -hmm. by the DNA. 
Uh, and thereafter, of course, after molecular biology, I had the opportunity to then pursue a PhD where I thought human genetics was very, very interesting for the kind of work I was doing at the time. So during my master's, I had an opportunity to do two sorts of internships, one for a company, one for an academic uh, a research group. And so I also had the experience of seeing uh, the differences between working for a company versus working at an academic institution. And I immediately realized that perhaps maybe PhD is something that I want to pursue because mm -hmm. uh, I was more intrigued by the the research questions that we ask. I, 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 the scientist inside me sort of woke up at that particular period of time. And so I then decided to pursue a PhD in, uh, uh, in human genetics uh, in the Netherlands uh, at the University Medical Center Groningen. Mm. Um, then, you know, going back to how I started the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization yeah. uh, in the year 2017, actually, I had the chance of um, going to Egypt, Cairo, yeah. for the Africa Society of Human Genetics Conference that was mm -hmm. happening in Cairo. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, 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 the actual co-founding or the inception of THGO actually began in Cairo, mm -hmm. whereby we had about 800 or 850 delegates that were attending the conference, all of them from different parts of Africa, from yeah. different parts of the Asian continent and the American continent. And I realized that in that group of about 850, 900 people that were mm -hmm. there attending the conference, uh, we were only two who are from Tanzania. So it was myself and Dr. Siana Nkia. Uh, mm -hmm. The two of us. And I, of course, at that time, I was not even living in Africa. I was living in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and Siana was definitely the only one who actually came, flew from Tanzania to Cairo. And so when we realized two things, you know, one, the gravity of the problem uh, as far as human genetics in Africa is concerned. And then number two, you know, already Africa is in trouble. And yeah. then within that scope, Tanzania was nowhere to be seen. Yeah. So we were just two people. And so, you know, the first day attending the opening ceremony and uh, the initial keynote speeches, so Siana and I and, and myself, we decided that we would chuck the conference for the remaining four days and we locked ourselves in the lobby. And that was the really the, the discussions we were having about how do we really conceptualize the formation of the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization? What are we going to do with that organization? What areas that we really want to function? Uh, who do we really want to invite on the board? Uh, what roles will they play on the board? And uh, subsequently, how do we really promote human genetics uh, research, training, diagnostics in Tanzania? So that's how it all started. Um, we initially, we, we were working in four main areas, which was uh, research, diagnostics, training, and advocacy. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we had the honor of uh, having the former president of Zanzibar, uh, His Excellency Dr. Ali Mohammed Chen, who was a biochemist himself, okay. who challenged us that why don't you also look at therapeutics? Mm -hmm. So we added our fifth component uh, to THGO, where we said mm -hmm. not only will we do research, uh, mm -hmm. diagnostics, training, advocacy, but we will also add the therapeutics component. Mm -hmm. So that was simply the start of how THGO came about. Uh, and in fact, from 2017, uh, after conceptualization, working online for, for the next two years, in 2019, we actually launched uh, the society at uh, the Tanzania Health Summit in Dodoma uh, mm -hmm. in front of the deputy health minister at the time, who was also the patron of the, um, of the organization, Dr. Faustin Dugulile, who is, of course, most of you probably know, he's currently the new WHO uh, Africa chair, chair, director general of the WHO Africa. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in uh, 2021, we formally registered and also organized the Africa Society of Human Genetics Conference uh, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So that's how uh, the whole journey of genetics in Tanzania started. Mm, that's that's amazing like that's amazing progress and you know i think we've had this conversation but you know for others that are also interested in this in their own countries i think if you're thinking of this muhammad is one person to reach out to in terms of resources and even just how to go about starting you know a human genetics organization in your specific country i mean um 
for for me personally, I mean, I have uh, I'm thinking of finishing my PhD first, and then we can have this conversation. But anyone else that would consider that from Kenya, I think uh, Muhammad is your guy. So Muhammad, while we are still talking about you know THGO, can you tell us some of the you know something that you feel has been significant uh, have, has been a significant milestone that you guys have been able to achieve as an organization since you founded it. Yeah, um, and, and, and this is a very personal story. Yeah. So when we initially started the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization, let me tell you that we had no money, zero shillings. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took um, a group of us, we were about 10 to 12 people who were very passionate, uh, very driven to promote genetics in the country. And I remember till today that we used to put 30,000 Tanzanian shillings every month from our pockets. Uh, for the for the next 24 months. So each mm -hmm. of us, we were about 10 to 12 people, and yeah. everyone would contribute 30,000 Tanzania shillings yeah. uh, on the table every month for the next 24 months so, to raise some funding so that we can start our operations, get ourselves registered, develop yeah. a constitution, develop our areas of, uh, of work. And then slowly we started to develop what are our interests and how do we make sure that we are actually progressing in terms of the objectives that we set out. So within yeah. research, we have two major ambitious projects. The first one is that we want to have a Tanzania human genome project, which means mm -hmm. we would like to sequence uh, to at least 20,000 Tanzanian people so that we yeah. have a representation of, you know, one maybe something for the audience. One of the hugest challenges today in human genetics field is that Africans are not well represented uh, in yes. global genetic data sets. If we yes. look at the numbers, these numbers are decreasing by the year. Uh, you know, in 2016, Africa was represented by 3% of the total data that's existing. In 2022, that data went from 3% to 1.1%. So in fact, Africa is reducing its representation uh, in, in these global genetic data sets. Now, Africa is a continent of 54 countries, more than yep. 1.4 billion people, which approximately is about 20% of the global population. But its representation into these genetic data sets is less than 1%. How do we expect that we are going to utilize um, the existing data to help yep. us for molecular diagnostics, for development of drugs, for gene therapy, for pharmacogenomics, and many yeah. other applications. It is really yeah. li limiting us. And so it is important yeah. that we raise that awareness. We raise yeah. the capacity, we build the capacity and infrastructure to do the kind of work that we want to do to ensure that genomic medicine, uh, and we talk about precision medicine, uh, you know, is actually realized by yeah. increasing this representation of African people. Absolutely, and so, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing that I really think um, we, we made a huge uh, yeah. impact to the lives of people with rare diseases is that uh, we partnered with a, with a, a patient organization called Ali Kimara Foundation. Uh, and that really changed how people looked at human genetics in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. We got hold of the president of the country mm -hmm. and we even made sure that in the year 2021, 2022, the fiscal budget of the parliament included a component within the Ministry of Health. They included a budget that was meant to provide um, medication, diagnostic uh, capabilities and education for children mm -hmm. living, living with rare diseases uh, in Tanzania. And this was approved by the parliament through the pressure from the, uh, the president herself. So this was something that we really are very proud of, uh, that we today, if you are a child with rare diseases, you are... Mm -hmm. Uh, eligible to apply for funding from the government to do homeschooling, to be able to be admitted to a hospital, to be able to get access to drugs. Um, and of course, we are currently in the process of developing a database where we can really find out how many children actually are suffering from rare diseases uh, in the country. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for, for sharing that. So for someone that doesn't know what you mean by rare diseases, can you elaborate on that? Yes. And sort of like so, give an example? Yeah. Yes, definitely. So rare diseases by definition means any disease that occurs uh, one in 2,000 people. So it mm. is something that is really, really rare. If you look at a group of 2,000 people or 2,000 newborn children, you'll only find one of that case. 
but mm -hmm. what happens is that rare diseases are many in 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 yeah. number. We have got about mm -hmm. seven thousand different diseases that are classified as rare diseases. And the interesting fact about it is that eighty percent of the rare diseases are genetically predisposed, meaning that mm -hmm. they occur because of a change in the DNA of that particular patient. And so mm -hmm. the role of genetics in providing accurate diagnosis to these children with rare diseases and subsequently find a therapeutic potential is critical. Uh, and therefore, you know, in our setting, we, we, we find ourselves because we are not very well trained uh, from our universities in Africa, many patients that suffer from rare diseases take on average about seven years before they get yeah. a diagnosis. And they have to go through maybe 10 or 11 different clinicians to arrive to a particular diagnosis. So not only are we wasting our resources, but it's also a lot of a pain to the children who are suffering and the caretakers because there is a lot of economic uh, 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 you know, disadvantage that these people have to go through. And so it is really, really important that we wake up together, work together so that we are helping these children uh, you know, get accurate diagnosis in an earlier manner. Thank you, Mohammed. And I hope that this is sort of like, I know a lot of uh, Africans are trying to put in the work to try and see that there is, you know, change or a difference in this. But for those that are, are yet to see the importance of this, I hope this is a wake up call uh, based on, you know, the data and the statistics that we have and the importance of genetics uh, in disease, especially rare diseases. And now that we are talking about diseases, Mohammed, uh, let's, you know, sort of like switch a bit to sickle cell disease. I know a lot of people just hear about anemia and then, uh, you know, sometimes sickle cell uh, anemia, but some people might probably not know what sickle cell anemia is and how, you know, what impact it has on the individual, on the economy and, you know, those, those kind of things. So can you speak to us about sickle cell yes. disease and what you as a person uh, does uh, in that area of research and what yes. the Tanzanian Human Genetic Organization also does? Absolutely. So first of all, just to start off with, um, you know, sickle cell disease is a genetic condition. In fact, to be more precise, it is a monogenic condition. When I say monogenic means that it is caused by one single mutation. So in the hemoglobin HBB gene, in the sixth position, the A converts to a T. So as we know, the DNA is made up of four different types of nucleotides. So on that sixth position, the A converts to a T and subsequently the protein uh, glutamic acid becomes valine. And therefore what happens uh, is that the red blood cells that are produced in these patients with sickle cell disease are no longer round shape. They become banana shape or sickle shape. And because of the sickle shaped cells of the red blood cells, they start to agglutinate. They start to get clotted. And because they get clotted, they become clumps that are difficult to now pass in your bloodstream. And because of that, the patients who are suffering from sickle cell disease suffer from severe pain. We call them crisis. And then subsequently, if they are not uh, early detected or not treated properly, then these patients also get all sorts of complications in their organs. And subsequently, they will die. Now, to give you a few numbers of it. So sickle cell disease um, is one of the most uh, widely spread sort of monogenic condition in the world. There are about 300 million people living with that, uh, and more, more than 75% are living in Africa. If we look at Tanzania as a case study, uh, we are the fifth highest incidence rate in all of the world, which means that we have on average about 11,000 to 14,000 children that are born with sickle cell disease every year in Tanzania. And the sad reality is that more than 50% of those children will die before the age of five. So before even they live up to the age of five, they will die. Now, one of the earliest ways to prevent sickle cell from getting uh, you know, in a, in a very uh, aggressive pro prognosis is to ensure that they have their immunizations on time, uh, that they have regular blood transformations because anemia is another uh, uh, symptom that occurs in these patients. They have a very low, low blood count. And so it is important for them to get new, new blood uh, all the time. Uh, but also they need something called hydroxyurea. Now this hydroxyurea is a pill 
that is normally supposed to keep the hemo fetal hemoglobin levels high. Because what happens is as when a person is maturing from young child to an adult, the fetal hemoglobin goes down and the adult hemoglobin goes up. And as soon as the adult hemoglobin goes up, because you have a sickle cell patient, there is no adult hemoglobin, it's sickle hemoglobin. So what happens with hydroxyurea, it tries to keep the fetal hemoglobin higher and keeps the sickle hemoglobin low. But again, all these treatments, including immunizations, um, providing them with blood transfusions, providing them with hydroxyurea, are all mm -hmm. symptomatic relief. They are mm -hmm. not curative options. Mm -hmm. Now, again, in the developed world, already because they are doing a good job to provide these patients with immunization protocols, with the hydroxyurea pills, with the uh, blood exchange transfusion programs, you will see that the survival rate is much more higher. Mm -hmm. So sickle cell patients in the Western part of the world live on, you know, up to 60, 70 years old. Yeah. Whereas in Africa, because of the lack of this accessibility to these things, uh, yeah. our children die before the age of five. Now in Tanzania, of course, I must mention uh, Professor Julie Makani, who yeah. has been a pioneer in the yeah. field of doing research uh, diagnostics, uh, advocacy, and training in the field of sickle cell disease. She has developed, in fact, one of the largest cohorts of patients with sickle cell disease in Tanzania, which is still currently used uh, uh, in our research uh, 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 methods. And we are now slowly, uh, and I would say that Tanzania and Uganda are yes. both equally uh, moving forward in the area of something called gene therapy. Yeah. And gene therapy is whereby you are now using um, um, really gene editing tools like CRISPR-Cas9 mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. edit the mm -hmm. DNA of the mm -hmm. patient mm -hmm. uh, and then to replace that mutation. So you want to remove the mm -hmm. mutation that causes the sickling of the red blood cells. So yeah. the moment you neutralize that, that means the patient will no longer be able to produce the sickled red blood cells. And that's the idea. And, and that is a curative form of therapy. However, um, the bad news is that for one patient to undergo genetic therapy for sickle cell disease, it costs about 1.8 to 2 million US dollars. And of course, as you can imagine, in Africa, living in our situation, it is yeah. almost impossible for us yeah. to be able to afford this amounts, these high amounts of funding for a patient. And so what really needs to happen uh, is, of course, we need to invest into infrastructure, knowledge, skills, so that we are able to produce this uh, in the mm -hmm. country. And mm -hmm. so in Tanzania, via um, our work, what we are now trying to do um, is establish sort of a research platform where we are able to collect cord blood because cord blood is a rich source of hematopoietic stem cells. Mm -hmm. And then from the cord blood, we collect CD34 cells because these CD34 cells are the progenitor cells that will produce the red blood cells. Mm -hmm. And then from those CD34 cells, we now want to use the CRISPR-Cas9 to do the editing by ourselves in our own universities, in Africa, by Africa, for Africa. That's the idea. And so once we are able to do that, then when the technology becomes applicable, where we start to do clinical trials, where we start to have a proper infrastructure to be able to do uh, cross-cutting research with, you know, cross-cutting uh, edge technologies. Mm -hmm. The pricing, hopefully, will go down and, and, and we'll be able to approach more patients with the curative option. You know, you have shared so much details. <laughs> I can't even break it down, but I hope all of you have gotten that. And, you know, as we are speaking about that, and I guess this is the next front frontier, you know, bringing, you know, the clinical trials and, and all... Um, the gene editing gene therapy uh in, in the future right what how do you think the scientific community can support you both in the continent and outside the continent this is a fantastic question so you know science is such a field where you cannot go as one person you yeah. know there is this this very famous um uh, african uh, proverb that if you want to go far you go together and if you yeah. if you want to go fast you go alone Science, yeah. unfortunately, is not something you want to go fast. You want yeah. to go far. So yeah. we need both local um, institutional collaborations, meaning that if today Uganda and Tanzania have already started 
to develop some things from the research perspective. Now, how do we make sure that our colleagues in Botswana, our colleagues in Namibia, our colleagues in yeah. Cameroon, our colleagues from other parts of Africa, leverage yeah. what we already know? Because remember, yes. some of the problems are very similar in our countries yeah. and their countries, you know, and yeah. the suffering is the similar. Our culture is very, very similar. So there is a lot of learning we can do within mm -hmm. the continent. But at the same yeah. time, it is also critically important to maintain international collaborations because the technologies, the skill set, the knowledge, they have it. They have already done yeah. it. They have already yeah. been through it. So we want yes. to manage and leverage those international collaborations so that um, we learn from them and not only learn from them, but also avoid the mistakes they have made. Yeah. This is one of the advantages when we are playing catch up is that you don't have to then make necessarily make the same mistakes they have made. So yeah. this is the reason why I say that, you know, um, there needs to be a mechanism where we are adapting to technology transfer, especially mm -hmm. and I would say especially mm -hmm. from the diaspora, yeah. because the diaspora is equally important because they have their hearts in Africa. Yes. Anyone you ask today who is living outside Africa, but is an African uh, by birth or by descent will yeah. always tell you that no matter where I'm staying, my yeah. heart will still be in Africa. So exactly. use those connections, yeah. leverage those connections and try and bring back that technology through their sources. Uh, and of course, at the same time, we also need to be good advocates. We yeah. need to awa raise awareness through mm -hmm. our uh, 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 governments, policymakers, but we also need to educate our, our people. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, genetic conditions can be misunderstood yes. uh, through those uh, social stigma stereotypes that, oh, this is a witchcraft or this is a voodoo. But in fact, it is not. This is a genetic condition. So this yeah. is where really advocacy and mass education awareness programs come yeah. into play. Uh, yeah. and, and that's how I would see uh, the importance of, of collaborations. That is like, that's very good that you've mentioned that aspect about advocacy and, you know, uh, community engagement. And I think it's a very important aspect of research because I think a lot of times researchers or scientists focus, you know, more on just the scientific community. And uh, a few times they try to engage the community, but I think it's also important for the community to be aware of what is happening so that they can know when you're asking someone to come and be a participant in a clinical trial, they understand why the sacrifice is important and yes. why they actually, you know, they shouldn't, they should be a participant. It shouldn't, it shouldn't just be about that we are paying you to come and be a clinical uh, trial participant. And speaking about that, um, Hamid, what is THGO doing in terms of community engagement and in terms of breaking the stereotypes um, for these uh, genetic conditions? Very, very good question. So as I mentioned, uh, we have five arms of operation and one of the yes. most important arms of operation is advocacy. Yeah. And I always tell uh, uh, people that we approach advocacy from two different angles. You have the high level advocacy where we are talking to politicians, we are talking yes. to policymakers, yeah. and then you have the low level advocacy where we are indulging into mass education. Yes. And so what we do is uh, we write articles on the newspapers in Swahili. Oh, we wow. write, we go on the radio, we go on TV shows, mm -hmm. we write magazines uh, in Swahili and distribute for free uh, at the hospitals and other areas of public. Uh, we go on... Uh, um, YouTube, we have our YouTube channel where we yeah. uh, advocate for uh, patients. We have focus group discussions with patient organizations. Oh, wow. We partner with the Sickle Cell Foundation, Sickle mm. Cell Warriors, uh, and we also listen to them. You know, It's not always that we are the ones who are doing the talking. Sometimes you would be surprised that yeah. you will learn a lot more from the patient themselves than when yes. you than you think you can, you can give. And so yeah. it is critically important to establish, number one, that relationship between the patient organization and groups like us. Yeah. And then you see how you can bridge the gap between politicians who are writing the policies and yeah. the people at the low level who have actually no access to them. So yeah. groups like us come as a bridge maker between those two groups and mm -hmm. see how best we can uh, improve the situation. 
yeah thank you so much i i, I will come and borrow the, <laughs> i'll come and borrow <laughs> all the advocacy <laughs> uh, mechanisms that you i think they're brilliant ideas and if you uh, can share the youtube channel i know there yes. are a few tanzanians that are here uh, but also we'll just share it as well in our YouTube so people can access that uh, information as well as the newsletters as well that you share with uh, with the uh, people in Tanzania. I think, you know, if we highlight such uh, kind of uh, things, then it means other people can pick it up uh, from the continent as well and they can implement it in their different countries. And I would like to pause here and uh, take questions from the audience. If you have a question for Mohammed, please raise uh, raise up your hand, or if you can't uh, speak up, then just type in the uh, chat and then I'll read it out. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that while Mohammed is sharing the um, the link as well as uh, his profile if you want to reach out to him uh, later on. But yeah, this is my son's journey. Uh, I hope you're enjoying uh, the time so far with our speakers here. I'm also going to share a short survey that I'd like every one of us to feel. It will just take one minute of your time about today's session. I, you know, I know all of us have enjoyed both from uh, listening from Julius and as well as listening from Mohammed. And we would like to, you know, hear about your experience and how we can also improve things for uh, future MSJ sessions. So I'll, I'll share that link uh, right now on the chat. So if you can please just um, copy it, if you can please fill it, um, that will be very helpful for us so we can know uh, what is working and what is not working and what we need to improve on. All right, so uh, it looks like people are still thinking about, okay, Abigail, go ahead. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, hi, thanks very much for this interesting topic, um, Mohammed. Um, a quick question, I just because I know you, you your company is focused more on the private, on the curative. If correct me if I'm wrong, but what I caught from all you said was more onto the curative aspect, right? Um, yes. Yeah. The other question I wanted to find out is, I know you're also into advocacy, community sensitization, and all that. Is there any way? where you look into the preventative aspects as well, especially with the more people are aware of the fact that, oh, okay, I've got this genotype, you know, marrying somebody with a similar genotype might, you know, high chance of possibility of getting kids with sickle cell disease. Is there any area of work you're doing in that line or are there other yes. bodies you collaborate with as well? That, that is a fantastic question and I'm really glad you brought it up. So, you know, we, we tend to talk about the science that we do uh, yeah. more often because that is where we get into the lab and do all the fancy stuff. Uh, and, and, and that's why we like to talk more about how are we treating a patient or how are we going towards curative options. But one of the simplest, easiest, cheapest option of preventing sickle cell disease is, is, is by prevention, uh, is by just knowing your status. And so what has Tanzania at the moment um, um, approached is something called a newborn screening program. And, in, and as soon as the child is born, uh, they do a, a, a very simple genotyping blood test where they know the status of the child, whether the child is a carrier, whether the child is uh, normal, or whether the child is uh, sickled, meaning SS. And so if you know the status of the husband uh, and the wife, then you will know, of course, potentially uh, the chances that each pregnancy will uh, give you a possibility of having a child with sickle cell disease. And so for those of you who are smart enough, uh, you'll be able to calculate your chances and hopefully prevent uh, sickle cell death. So obviously, you know, there are multiple ways to roam. One of them is by already looking into uh, treatment options symptomatically, but also curative options. The smarter way is by preventive measures, because not only that, that's the cheapest way to do it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, go ahead, buddy. Uh, sorry, uh, if I'm butchering your name. <laughs> That's okay. Um, that was a great question, Abigail. I was just wondering, are, is there any um, genetic testing available pre-conception, so almost like pre-conception counselling to prevent that? Is that an option in Tanzania? So, so 
um, there are different stages at which a genetic test can be done. One is, in fact, knowing your status is already a preconception testing because once you know the status of you or your husband, you then already know in each pregnancy what are the chances that you get a child with a particular condition. The other op uh, option of testing is something called the non-invasive prenatal testing. This means that when the mother is already conceiving a child and in their first trimester, that means between the first and the third month, you can already do uh, a, a blood test called NIPT. And over there, the NIPT, and the, the, the biology of it is very simple, that when a mother is pregnant, in her blood stream, there are small particles, uh, we call them cell-free DNA, that are moving or that are swimming that come from the fetus, that come from the child that she's carrying. And so once we are able to extract some blood from our peripheral blood, extract the cell-free DNA of the child, we can then determine whether that particular child is suffering from a condition. Now, many times people don't want to do that, especially in our setting, is because we are still very much religiously bound. We're still very much um, co social culturally bound because are we ready to face the consequences. Because today, if I can tell you, I will do a blood test for a woman who is pregnant in her first trimester. And I can tell her with very high confidence that the child that she's currently bearing is suffering or is going to suffer from Patau syndrome. Now, Patau syndrome, what we know about Patau syndrome is that the child once it delivers will not survive beyond three weeks. There is no cure to this and the child will die. So the question then comes up, do you want to terminate the pregnancy? Do you want to go ahead with the pregnancy? And given the fact that you have to now take into consideration the law of the land, but also mm -hmm. your religious beliefs. I've got people in my genetic counseling practice asking me, uh, Doc, am I allowed to abort? What does the Bible or what does the Quran say? Uh, you know, you know, at that point of time, you start thinking, OK, these are serious questions that are intertwined with someone's religious faith. And I'm not yeah. here to play the priest or the or the, or the malim. I'm I'm mm -hmm. simply a scientist going to try and give you information that allows you to make an informed decision. And so those things really need to be put into perspective uh, before we start implementing them. Is the mm -hmm. country ready? Uh, are people ready from a from a cultural perspective, from a societal perspective, which is very challenging in our setting? Wow, very very very. I don't know how to describe it. Very insightful. <laughs> Very insightful. I don't think I personally had thought about it in that perspective, especially the religion aspect. Uh, yeah. But it's very interesting to actually think about th things in that way and how it influences, you know, people engaging in 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 uh, practices that, you know, uh, would set them up for, you know, when you decide, okay, I'm keeping this pregnancy, but I know that my kid is going to carry this particular syndrome or this particular mutation, and how that would impact my life or if I'm aborting just you know to ensure that I don't bring a child that would come and suffer instead you're um, absolutely right you know if, if I can just share one more antidote uh, yeah. uh, from my genetic counseling practice and yeah. you know yeah. I am a feminist I, I I believe that women deserve equal opportunity in everything yeah. uh, one of the hardest things for me yeah. uh, in, in in my practice is to yeah. to come across um, a, a, a woman who has just delivered a child with a, uh, a, a serious condition that leads to yeah. uh, developmental delay, intellectual disability, uh, different sort of facial dysmorphologies. And you know the child is eventually uh, going yeah. to give up and, and particularly pass away. Yeah. But because of the um, stereotype and stigmatization yeah. that we have in our communities, yeah. We think that all these genetic conditions come because of the fault of the woman. Yeah. And here I am, I'm telling you that that is not true. Yeah. We must fight that. Because yes. people think that this is the problem of a woman. I'm sorry to say that is not true. Um, many a times you end up with the husband wanting to leave the wife mm -hmm. or the mother-in-law uh, mm -hmm. wanting to break the marriage of, of, of yeah. such a, a, a child. Um, yeah. And in the end, it is so sad because... Most of the times, the woman um, is, is, is uneducated. Um, she will lose the child. The husband yeah. will leave her. And yeah. she will have no place to go, especially if they have run away and, 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 and had a love marriage of, of some sort. 
And yeah. so what happens is that they will either get into prostitution yeah. or get into severe depression and start drugs or they will commit suicide. So yeah. this is something that, you know, if you are a feminist out there uh, and you really care for people who are delivering with such conditions, raise yeah. your voices and fight yeah. for your rights. You know, this is very, very important. Yeah, thank you. I feel like, you know, Muhammad, we invited you to share yourselves journey with us, but you've shared so much more. I think, you know, this goes beyond just, you know, your science journey. This speaks to, you know, uh, the community as well, what people should actually be thinking about and be doing and implementing in their uh, respective countries and across the continent as well. In this particular space of actually, you know, sickle cell disease, but even other genetic conditions as well. I think you've raise the awareness very well in this platform and I, I think we should just give you your flowers as we continue to take questions <laughs> from the audience and thank you for sharing you know such in, insightful um, uh, um, you know comments uh, about you know your research and as well as just the community of community perspective of, of things so yeah thank you so much and uh, Michael has a question Michael go ahead Okay, thank you very very much for giving me this opportunity to ask a question. I want just to I have just one simple questions. Okay, as a, as an organization, how are you spreading awareness of the disease to and its diagnosis and probably its medication to the general population in Tanzania? Thank you, Michael. This is a, a very critical uh, question, and I think it's very important. So what we do is um, at the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization, we have two uh, major groups of people that we work with. The first one is the communications team, uh, and these are all undergrad and postgraduate students that are currently receiving mentorship uh, within the organization. And the second is we have an events team. Uh, that is also a group of undergrad and postgrad students uh, that are receiving mentorship under THGO. What we try and do is we create scientific uh, uh, knowledge into bits, so really pocket-sized information, and we produce that in English and Swahili, and we circulate that information on our social media platforms. So we have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have TikTok, that's something we've started uh, that's a bit beyond my generation, but I think very, very important in today's world. Uh, and yeah. we also have, uh, uh, um, um, you know, the Instagram. Uh, we have yeah. YouTube channels as well. So we develop these small pocket-sized information about different sorts of diseases. We also partner with different patient organizations. So in Tanzania, yeah. we have a multiple myeloma group. We have a sickle cell group. We have a, a, a myasthenia gravis group. We have uh, a hemophilia group. We have... Um, uh, a muscular dystrophy group. So all these patient organizations, we partner with them, we ask them questions about their lives, and then we use that information uh, to develop uh, um, sort of pocket-sized information for social media dissemination. Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. I hope that answers your question, Michael. And I'll proceed to Bravin. Bravin, go ahead. And I saw that you had typed the question already on the on the chat. I don't know whether you want to ask the same question, but uh, her first question is regarding, uh, I think, application. She's interested. Bravin is interested in uh, general biotechnology uh, or molecular biology, and I think you can just speak about uh, for other young African scientists that are interested in pursuing careers uh, in in this you know space. What would you? What would be your advice to them? Yeah, sure. Um, so biotechnology is a very vast field, and I think uh, Bravin already addressed that in, in the comment. Uh, it yeah. is something like doing a, 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 an MBBS, right? You you want to become a yeah. general practitioner, you do a, a, a general program. And so biotechnology is something like that. Uh, but biotechnology also covers stuff like agriculture, uh, plant sciences, zoology. Uh, it also has human sciences, as well as environment. It has marine biology. So there's a lot of things you can start to really um, do a specialization in. If you're someone who loves the aquatic life, then marine biology is for you. If, you. if you're someone who likes animals, then zoology could be for you. If you're someone who likes the environment, then environmental sciences is for you. So it really depends on what your heart wants. So mm -hmm. for me, it was always about touching human lives. 
yeah. therefore I went into molecular biology because that was something that allowed me to have the skill set required uh, to do something about uh, human human genetics or touching the lives of human beings uh, yeah. in different ways. Uh, and so ideally, you know, people who are aspiring scientists in this field can decide to do a bachelor's in biotechnology or bachelor's in biochemistry or bachelor's in biomedical sciences uh, or biomedical engineering for that matter. And then as you do your, your undergrad and you now want to go into postgrad, it is very, very important to think about now, okay, I'm now, I've done the, the, the basics. What is it that the extra skill set do I need to then go into a field that I love? So yeah. for me, molecular biology was a skill set that I chose. People yeah. decide to do biochemistry. People like to do microscopy. People like to do virology. So it really depends on what you really feel that that, that particular field is for you. Uh, yeah. And then in the end, of course, you know, there are multiple uh, opportunities after your master's. Some of them like to do a PhD and get into academic life. Yeah. Some of them like to do an industry life. So you can do an MBA after. Sometimes you want to be a lawyer and that's possible. Uh, yeah. Because you still need lawyers to work for those scientific companies. Um, sometimes you want to do something like genetic counseling. Uh, sometimes you like computational sciences, so you can do bioinformatics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people like to do, uh, let's say, playing around with health economics. So yeah. stuff like how much economy are we saving uh, or, yeah. or losing because of not implementing or because of implementing a particular technique for a particular yeah. disease. So there are yeah. multiple opportunities for people to dive into, uh, especially from your undergrad to your master's to your PhD. It all yeah. depends on what is really of your interest and do it's, what your heart tells you. And I totally agree with you. I, I keep on saying that, you know, it doesn't make sense to spend 20 years doing something that you don't like. You know, you're just forcing yourself to get out, get up uh, and go and do it just for the money. It's not, it, it doesn't make sense. So just do what you're passionate about. And I think uh, Bravin has a second question, which is regarding how uh, THGO, but I think you've answered that. Yes. So about, what, yeah. what we do is we have a mentorship program within yeah. THGO that yeah. takes undergraduate students and we try and provide them mentorship. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, and um for for anyone that is interested in joining uh THGO or you know just joining your team, what what would be the next steps be? So I think um if you open our website thgo.or.tz, there yeah. is a membership application form that you can find. Yeah. Uh, and you can simply enter your dials and you can become a member by paying a very, very small fee. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you will immediately be able to uh, uh, benefit from our um, weekly uh, mailing letters, mailing list letters that we send, quarterly reports. And yeah. you will already also come across a lot of opportunities that we post through our yeah. mailing list for our members. We also have very specialized uh, training programs that we organize. Yeah. Uh, and you, you, if you're a member, then you have of course, the benefits of getting more discounts and those kinds of things. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And before I invite Buddy uh, to ask the final question, I'd like to remind all of us to fill in the short survey that I have shared on the chat. It will just take one minute of your time. So that would be useful for us in, you know, improving this uh, MSJ for future, um, uh, for the future. So please, please, please uh, fill in the survey. Uh, it won't take much of your time. Go ahead, buddy. Hello. And please, um, please tell me how to pronounce your name. <laughs> um, so it's Manjo, Manjo Badi. Oh, okay. So I got it. Cool. That's okay. Um, I have a question about so the THGO advocacy. Is there a scope to target those who um, are less health literate? So, for example, um, your communication and social media work that would target people who are already involved in um, or aware about these um, genetic conditions. But what about the general public? Is there any scope to um, help educate and communicate? Yes, absolutely. Um, so like I mentioned before, uh, we don't only uh, uh, um, advocate via social media. We also go on local radio stations. We go on television, so we have even TV shows uh, that that really allow us to promote genetics in the local language, in Swahili. 
Uh, we also write articles on newspapers that are, that are much more circulated locally than social media. So we try our best to sort of uh, advocate in different mediums and platforms that allow us, at least we make the effort of thinking about those people uh, that might not necessarily be able to afford a phone or be able to have, uh, let's say, internet on their phone, so to speak. Um, but of course, you know, if you have more ideas and you think that there are avenues that we could explore together, you know, we are very, very open for uh, local and international collaborations. We've, we've done that with the American society. We've done that with the European society, and we continue uh, to work with multiple organizations that are locally based, but are also internationally based. So if you've got any ideas, please do reach out uh, and we'd be very happy to sort of you know work together. Of course, yeah. All right, thank you. So as I continue to speak, please continue filling in the uh, survey. We are winding down. Uh, so Mohamed, I would like to invite you to give a final remark, like just an overall, you know, anything you'd want to speak about that you haven't spoken about uh, or something that, you know, should be, uh, I don't want to say remembered, <laughs> but yeah, a closing remark. <laughs> yes, no, I, 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 I want to address uh, all the people that are in this call uh, with a very Pan-African spirit. Um, I think, I think, as far as implementation of precision medicine is concerned, as far as research on human genetics is concerned, this needs to be a Pan-African effort. It is not possible that we will walk this by ourselves. And so whether you are in the diaspora uh, mm -hmm. with your roots you know, in Africa, or yeah. whether you are living in Africa, yeah. you have a role to play. What you really need to do is to awaken your Pan-African spirit and take the necessary steps especially if you are in the field, uh, to work towards increasing representation, whether it's through partnerships, whether it's through, you know, having a small component of, of, of samples coming in from Africa so that you're doing your research while you're also involving your country. Whether you're doing advocacy, whether you're doing diagnostics, whether you're simply doing a charity, the most important thing is that uh, we need to be the Africa's, um, I would say, uh, ambassadors towards ensuring that any research henceforth that takes place, any grant agency henceforth that wants to donate, uh, we have to ask them, have you included the unrepresented populations? Yeah. Have you included the African populations? We make them accountable. We have to um, you know, be as one voice, act as one voice. Uh, and, and in the end, of course, uh, remember that sometimes the grass is always greener on, on the other side. Uh, but before you approach international collaborations, find out what you have locally. Talk yeah. to yourselves uh, and, and talk to your colleagues, your local institutional partners, maybe if not in the country, then at least in your regions and start talking to each other. I think that is critical to moving forward. 